Hi, everybody, and welcome back to She Thrives, Plant-Based, Strong and Free. I'm Margot Freitag. I'm the founder uh, and host of this incredible event for women who are ready for change, ready to up-level their health and their wellness, um, not just physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. And all of this is, of course, achievable once we get the food right and we get the lifestyle habits in place we can truly thrive. And today's interview, I am so excited to share with you. Um, we're gonna be learning a lot about this exact thing, especially as it relates to women and female health. I'd love to introduce you to Vandana Chawla. Vandana is an MD and she's a board certified physician in internal medicine and in lifestyle medicine. She's been practicing uh, a practicing primary care physician in Houston for nearly 20 years. And she's incorporated the tenets of lifestyle medicine into her practice and has seen patients lose weight, improve diseases of all kinds, and, and many, many health conditions, improving, including diabetes, um, well, and lots of different diseases, I understand. And so because of this experience, she's co-created lifestyledocs.com and um, she is focusing on eating right, being fit, reducing stress, and connecting more to achieve holistic wellness. So welcome, Vandana. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Margo. It's a pleasure. I wondered if you could, let's go back to the beginning, if you could tell us a little bit about how this all got started for you, because it's, it's an unusual story. It's usually the other way around. So I would love to uh, have you share this with us. Sure. So my story is um, that I was introduced to plant-based eating through my patients. Um, I love saying that you hear about people eating healthier because their doctors had a talk with them. In my case, the doctor became a vegan because my patients had a talk with me. End of 2012, I just kept getting vegan and plant-based patients in my clinic. Um, some, of were, some of them were new patients who were marking um, dietary um, preferences. Um, and then some were established patients who I had seen for years who were now coming in and telling me that they had changed their diet and they want to see if their cholesterol has gotten lower or they, or they just wanted to tell me that they're feeling much better, that they're getting off of their inhalers and they don't need their asthma medications anymore. Um, and, and one thing about vegan and plant-based patients is they like to let you know <laughs> that <laughs> they're vegan now. Um, and so at first, you know, I kind of ignored it a bit. Who wants to change their diet, right? Um, I didn't want to look into it. And I said, okay, good, good for you. I'm glad you're losing weight. Um, but because it kept happening, I, I was forced to do my own research and because I was seeing them get healthier. And when I did my own research, um, there was plenty of data out there, mountains of evidence on all aspects, health related aspect, environmental aspects and, and ethical aspects. And so February 1st of 2013, I officially became a vegan. And did you do it cold? Like, did you just do it overnight or was it gradual? So it was supposed to be gradual. Um, fortunately, my husband um, also did the research with me at the end of 2012. And he and I both, and actually I was vegetarian at the time and he was an omnivore at the time. And he said to me, if you have been vegetarian for compassion and nonviolence reasons all these years, 15 years of marriage, he was omnivore and I was vegetarian. Then you probably need to go vegan <laughs> when we were doing the research. So, okay, we decided January 1st, we were gonna start our transition period. May, I was gonna turn 40 that year. So we said, okay, if things go well, then for my 40th birthday, we would both go vegan. So January, we're doing the 21 day kickstarts online. You know, there are a whole bunch of them online that you can do. Um, and we're doing further research and we're looking into things and we're feeling better. So end of January, I say to him, I don't wanna wait till May. Um, can we go vegan sooner? 
And he said, I thought you would never ask. Oh. And February 1st became our official vegan anniversary. And actually last month, we just celebrated six years. Wow, congratulations. So what did you notice? I mean, how did your, I mean, obviously you saw all these changes in your own patients. What did you notice in your own health? So um, I've been a pretty healthy person all my life. Uh, I've been never overweight, um, no chronic diseases, just little things like migraines and seasonal allergies, which I thought is just normal part of life. There's nothing you can do to improve that. Well, when I changed my diet um, to eating more plant foods and not eating the inflammatory animal foods, mm -hmm. um, there's several things I noticed. One was increased energy. Um, my migraines went away. Well, I didn't realize that back in just one month, but I've now not had a migraine for six years. Um, my nasal allergies improved quite a bit to where I was able to get off of nasal steroids that I had been on for 10 years prior. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we used to think that nasal steroids cause very little systemic absorption of steroids and don't have the bad side effects that oral steroids will have. But since then, we found out that nasal steroids taken long term do increase our risk for osteoporosis. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm very happy that I was able to get off of those. Yeah. Um, and in general, just this presence of well-being. World Health Organization defines health as not just mere absence of disease, but presence of health and well-being. And so what I had in my life before was absence of disease. Right. And I feel like now, after I've been plant-based, I truly have presence of well-being in my life. You know, Dr. Chella, I have to tell you that this is one of the major things that, that shifted for me, and that is that my allergies disappeared. Mm -hmm. My asthma disappeared and my allergies disappeared. And people just don't even, they can't believe it. I mean, I, don't, I think some people still don't believe it, but it's true. I mean, I used to be allergic to just about everything. Mm -hmm. And my allergies, my sensitivities to not only foods, but to animals, to environmental, you know, uh, like pollen and that sort of thing. I just, it's non-existent. So I just found that fascinating. It really is. And we see, that, we see that a lot. Um, allergy and asthma are actually part of the same spectrum. So mm -hmm. similar things affect them. And dairy specifically, because it's so high in mucus, it's allowed certain number of pus cells, really adds on to the mucus in our sinuses, in our respiratory um, tract. So taking off dairy, we see a lot of improvement in allergies and asthma for patients. Definitely, I, I definitely could feel the, the, um, the viscosity of the, the uh, I guess, congestion or phlegm in my chest just came right down. It just, everything got better. So, uh, and people ask me too, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, uh, how did you give up cheese? That's, uh, that's a big challenge for people, but I think I, I found that once I was off it, I just felt so much better. There was no going back. Did you, have you had that experience and what have your patients said? Yeah, so many of my patients, that is their hardest thing is cheese. I personally didn't have that much um, I don't think I was eating much cheese even before. Um, I was doing a lot of yogurt, a lot of um, milk, and a lot of um, ice cream, and a um, lot of eggs um, that I took out of my diet. But cheese, for some reason, wasn't big for me. But for so many of my patients, that is the hardest thing. And I actually refer them to Dr. Neil Barnard's book, The Cheese Trap. And that has helped a lot of them. Um, realize that it's not their fault, that cheese is very addicting, um, and there are things that they can do. And like any other addiction, the main thing is to stop it altogether, not do it every once in a while, because then you still have the cravings, um, but stop it altogether, and then the taste buds change. Taste buds are totally trainable, um, and the cravings go away. Yeah. 
That's really good advice. And the, the idea that our, our taste buds are trainable is I think really important as well. And uh, it is true. I remember my very first cup of coffee with soy milk was, um, I, I almost cried. <laughs> And now I can't imagine any other way. So yeah, I mean, it's just- And great. I hear that from so many patients. I have patients who tell me that they used to love McDonald's or they used to love Whataburger. And now if they even go into the parking lot and can smell it, that smell makes, just, makes them nauseous now. They are, yeah. not only do they not crave it, but they're almost repulsed by it now. And so this is how quickly our taste buds can change in just about a month or two of not eating those foods, we can, we can rec recover from those addictions. Absolutely. So interesting. So this summit is really about women's health. And I know you are a wealth of knowledge in this area. And I wondered if you could share with us, just for our audience who may be thinking about leaning toward more of a plant-based lifestyle, uh, how eating this way, how shifting toward plant-based can actually heal you or, you know, improve your health, especially, you know, women's conditions that, that maybe we think of as frustrating and not resolvable in so many cases. Sure. So like you said, I'm internal medicine physician, which basically means primary care for adults. Um, but because I'm a woman, for some reason, that attracts a lot of female patients. So my practice is probably 65% female um, and then 35% um, male. So I see a lot of women issues, including uterine fibroids, heavy periods, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, menstrual migraines. Um, and it turns out so many of um, women issues are hormonally related. Mm -hmm. um, and as we take out the foods in, in our diet that have hormones in them, we notice huge improvements in women's health. Um, I myself many years ago have had um, uterus surgery done to take a fibroid out. Um, so not they wanted me to do a full hysterectomy, which I didn't want to do at that age because I didn't want to take a chance with early menopause. Um, right. Even though the OB-GYN said that they would leave my ovaries in and it sh I would still have hormones and it shouldn't cause early menopause. I had seen several patients who had had hysterectomy with their ovaries left in, but still ended up going through menopause. Mm. Wow. So I just had a fibrodectomy. Um, and if I had known then what I know now, I would not have gone through it. I would have just taken dairy out of my diet and that would have helped shrink the fibroid because I've seen patients do it now. Patients who take dairy out of their diet, um, their fibroids shrink, their polycystic ovaries, the ovaries um, on the, the cysts on the ovaries shrink to where sometimes they completely get resolved. Um, Fibrocystic breast disease, um, that shrinks. Actually, I had that too. I guess I had a bunch of little things. I, you know, <laughs> myself, I've had breast fibroadenomas and um, breast, breast fibrosis. Um, and they used to hurt around ovulation and certain times in my cycle when the cysts get bigger in your breast. Mm -hmm. And again, ever since I changed the diet, that has not been an issue. Um, so there are so many female related things that are related to hormones in our diet. And when we take out those hormones, um, you know, dairy specifically is so high in estrogen. Mm -hmm. Naturally, um, it's, it's even higher because of factory farming, because of all the growth hormones and things we inject um, and hormones that we inject to make them pregnant again very quickly after giving birth. But even if that was not going on, um, milk comes when mom, when a cow has just had a baby. And at that time, the estrogen levels are just high naturally because that's how nature works. So dairy is a big, big source of hormones. Can you speak to hormonally related cancers? 
have you seen, uh, maybe I'm just thinking about breast cancer, ovarian cancer, these cancers that, I mean, we have seen some, some uh, resolution with diet. And mm -hmm. you know, I know there's no real uh, true evidence, but there seems to be a lot of, a lot of suggestion that, that food can play a role. So could you speak to that? Yeah, so there isn't as much evidence in terms of curing or reversing these diseases with diet. Um, there are definitely many um, case studies and anecdotal experiences, including some of my patients who've had breast cancer um, in their 40s and then changed their diet because of their research, they realized to prevent recurrence, that's what they need to do, and they're doing amazing right now. Um, mm -hmm. But there is plenty of evidence that hormones in our food are linked to causing these cancers. Mm -hmm. So in terms of preventing them, there is data out there. In terms of reversing, not so much yet. So we do know that hormones in our food are linked to hormonally related cancers, which are prostate cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, yeah, so those, those are definitely, um, and uterus cancer, endometrial mm -hmm. cancer. Right. Um, those, we do know that there is a link. Um, we also know that there is a link between obesity and several cancers. So just being obese, for whatever reason. And we're more likely to be obese if we're eating a lot of calorie dense foods, which animal foods are high in caloric density, but not as high in nutrient density. Um, mm. Whereas plant foods are low in caloric density and high in nutrient density. So they help us be more our authentic BMI, our ideal BMI, um, where we were meant to be. So obesity has been linked to pancreatic cancer um, and also breast cancer. Um, there are a few others that I can't remember, but several cancers, including pancreatic and breast. Right, right. I remember hearing about pancreatic. All right, so there's no question then that prevention is the key and a large part of prevention is what we eat. And so um, just to, to follow up with that, you are doing something that's pretty amazing. You're opening a new clinic. And this clinic, I understand, is going to have a special space for things like cooking, demonstrations, and yoga. How exciting. I wish every doctor could do this. And I wish that, um, well, I hope that you'll share a little bit about this and what you're going to be doing and why. So um, 2017, I found out about a new field called American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And they were about to have their inaugural boards in October of 2017. And it was, I had just found out about it and there was not enough time to sign up or study or, or do all the prerequisites. So I decided I was gonna take it in October of 2018. Um, so October of 2018, I took the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine board exam and got board certified. Well, not just that, my husband, who is a radiologist, has been kind of hearing about all the stories I've been telling him about my patients getting off of insulin and reversing chronic diseases and no longer needing blood pressure medicines and no longer needing gout medicines, no longer needing erectile dysfunction medicine. Um, so he had gotten very interested in this and though he loves radiology his new passion has also become lifestyle medicine so mm -hmm. he actually studied we studied together i had a study buddy study buddy <laughs> for the lifestyle medicine board exam and he took it as well and passed it as well so we are actually going into business together uh, as lifestyle docs and wow. he's going to be joining the clinic part-time, so he's gonna do part-time radiology and part-time lifestyle medicine at first until we can make this kind of sustainable. <laughs> um, so this is the last year that he'll be practicing full-time radiology. So this new clinic um, will have exam rooms for my internal medicine stuff, but it will also have this big multi-purpose room with a little kitchen where we can do food demos. And we have a lot of people in the community who we've, we've kind of 
hope to collaborate with. We know food for life instructors, um, we know registered dietitians, and we know um, exercise physiologists and PhD in nutrition, and we hope to have them come in as part of the speaker series. Um, we want to be able to do um, yoga classes, which we have a lot of yoga teachers as our friends now, mm -hmm. um, and meditation sessions and group visits because lifestyle medicine really um, shows that there's a lot of data that when you do these group visits, when people can help each other along that path, um, it really helps them progress a lot faster than if they just had me. So lifestyle medicine has taught me that you kind of need a team, you kind of need a village to really help people along this path. Um, though I've been kind of practicing it in my own solo internal medicine practice and kind of going over goals and plans with patients in terms of like, you know, improving their nutrition, their exercise, their stress management, avoidance of tobacco and alcohol, their sleep, their mm -hmm. healthy relationships, you know, all the tenets of lifestyle medicine. Having just me is not enough for them. And that's what we hope this lifestyle med medicine clinic provides them with more support from other patients who are either farther along or behind them on this path to where they can learn from the ones that are farther along and they can help the ones that are behind them. Um, and also have things like registered dietitian and um, other people who can come in and help, help provide that support. Wow, that's great. Now, this is kind of, kind of an aside, but it might be interesting for some people. Uh, in Canada, our healthcare system is very different. But in the <laughs> States, I know that there are a variety of um, insurances. Does lifestyle medicine, um, is it often covered? Are there certain plans that cover it? Like, how, how will this work out for, for people who really need your services? Will it be typically covered by insurance, do you think? Um, we're hoping soon. Uh, that's one of the major things American College of Lifestyle Medicine is trying to do, um, is kind of get this be more covered. Um, right now, I'm still billing just internal medicine codes and just spending a much longer time with them doing lifestyle medicine as well. Um, and I think my husband may have to bill for a while as more a GP because he's done, they have to do a one year internal medicine um, internship before they go to radiology anyways. Um, so he may have to bill for that initially, but we're trying to learn all the coding with lifestyle medicine um, and how to code for group visits, which we can officially do. Um, yeah, so that is still, we're in the learning process and American College of Lifestyle Medicine is still in the process of making this sustainable for doctors who want to do this. Right. Um, because, you know, I, we don't need to make a big profit, but I don't want my new clinic to be an anti-profit thing either. Right, right. Um, well, it's to everybody's advantage, including the system. I mean, if we can help people take charge of their health, then we save so much in the future, not just in money, but our quality of life and our longevity and our happiness and all of that. And never mind, um, you know, the, the system that's heavily burdened with so much yeah. illness. So that's what I, I tell my patients that you are now the CEO of your health. Yeah, And I'm here to give you the data and guide you and help in whatever way I can. But I don't want you to just rely on pills and procedures and medical fields. I want you to be able to take control of your health and improve your health. And you know, not all of my patients are going to want to change their lifestyle. I understand mm -hmm. that. But they need to be given that choice. Every patient needs to be given that choice. For 20 years, um, what, what I had learned, and that's what I was doing, was only offering pills and procedures as the treatment. Right. And that is not the only thing that is, that is out there. So I need to offer lifestyle medicine, and not everybody will take it, but at least everybody needs to be offered that. Right, I love it. And then there's the other, that gray area, Maybe you can um, give me your thoughts on this. People who are willing to make some changes, but not all of the changes. 
can we still benefit if we don't completely embrace a fully plant-based lifestyle? I, I think we can. Um, but I do let people know that modest changes lead to modest results. Right. And radical changes lead to radical results. Right on. And everybody has got their own thing going on in life. And I understand that sometimes in life you can only take baby steps. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then we make a plan to take baby steps. And sometimes they're ready for leaps. And, or they're ready to go all the way plant-based. And if that's the case, then I work with them there. So I'd really try to meet them where they are. Um, and I love this new term, plant forward. Have you heard of that? No, but I love that. Yeah, yeah. I love it. So many of my patients um, are like, okay, I can't be plant-based, that's too strict, but I can be plant forward. So plant forward is somebody who is, who understands the value of a plant-based diet mm -hmm. and they at their own pace are working to decrease the animal foods and the processed foods from their diet and they're working to increase the plant foods for their diet. That's great. So yeah. Many of my patients are like, okay, I'm going to go home and tell my family today that I'm plant forward. Yeah. And I love the term because it's so positive, so non-judgmental. Um, it allows people to move in that direction. Um, at their own pace. And like I said, sometimes people take leaps and sometimes they take baby steps, but as long as they know that that's where they need to go for optimal health and wellness. I love that. I think that's such an important piece. Not everybody can just turn it around overnight. And a lot of people need to step in and lean in and take their time and make progressive changes. I love the term. I think that's great. So, um, let me see here. I have so many questions. I want to ask you about just aside from the food, because lifestyle medicine is not only food, although food is so, so important. Right. How can we manage, you know, our stress with lifestyle medicine? How can we change our mindset? How, what about exercise and fitness? How about these other pieces? How important are they? And how should we approach all of this? Right. So you're absolutely li right. Lifestyle medicine is much more than nutrition. However, it turns out nutrition is the biggest piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. So that is super important. Um, and it's funny how improving nutrition then helps you improve the other aspects kind of automatically. Like for my, for my case, um, all I did was become vegan, right? I hadn't planned on doing other things at this point. Um, and all my life, for 40 years, I was a very physically inactive person um, to where growing up, I was very much a science and math nerd, uh, did not like PE at all. That was the one <laughs> class that I was afraid I wouldn't get an A in. Uh -huh. um, then there's something about changing my nutrition, I don't know if it's because it truly gave me more energy and endurance and stamina, or if it just provided me with empowerment, that because I can do this, perhaps I can do other things as well. It does kind of make new connections in our brain to where we feel empowered to um, improve other aspects of our life too. So I started doing 5Ks and 10Ks, and I've done a half marathon, and I've had my teenage sons train me for a sprint triathlon, which involved swimming, running, and biking. Um, mm. I've done, all four of us, my husband and I and our two boys, we've done a Tour de Houston bike ride. Um, so all of the exercise and stuff just kind of came because I had made the dietary changes. Um, other things that are important besides nutrition and exercise are um, stress management, like you said. I would say that's, that's the next really important thing that we can work on. And there's been plenty of research that mindfulness activities really improve our health. Um, I would recommend that your um, viewers look up Dean Ornish's lifestyle trials. Right. And these trials where he included a bit of exercise and meditation and diet, 
changes. Um, they actually showed improvement in many other things than what he was testing. Um, so not only did it improve heart disease and um, prostate cancer trials, but really improved their health in many other ways. Um, and one of the most impressive um, studies is his study that showed telomere length. Right. Um, elongation to, so the telomeres are these parts of our DNA at the end that shorten as we get older. So the normal aging process shortens them throughout our life. Um, so in his study, I believe it was a five-year study, um, to where the telomere length actually increased in people who were practicing these lifestyle changes, yeah. who had been taught to use meditation, exercise, and healthy whole food plant-based diet. Um, I mean, that's another thing a lot of my women patients really like about this diet is anti-aging effects. Yes, very um, much. And so that, that gets some of us very excited about this lifestyle. And I myself, so I don't color my hair so I can see the difference. Um, so my hair is actually less gray now than it was six years ago when I went vegan. Isn't that amazing? Now that's yeah. extraordinary. Right, wow. right. Um, I have to say the same thing. I mean, I think that, you know, I feel, not only do I feel younger, my skin is better. It's just, it's easier to, uh, there's more energy to do things. I feel more inspired to exercise. All of the things you're talking about, I concur. So yes, I think that's great. No, I, I definitely feel better than I think I did in my 20s. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm about to turn 46 now. So yeah. definitely, um, like I mentioned, that, that well-being, um, physical and emotional well-being um, mm -hmm. that comes with practicing lifestyle medicine, um, practicing, you know, and I don't, I, don't, I don't do that much mindfulness activity. I try to sit for at least 10 minutes, just observing my breath. Um, I try to exercise every day. I try to follow lifestyle medicines. Um, yeah, lifestyle medicine really wants us to preach, well, practice what we preach. Um, so another thing that it has forced me to do is that resistance and weight training. Great. So for 45 years, I did do yoga um, and I did do um, some running uh, between 40 to 45. Before 40, I did nothing. Um, <laughs> Um, wow. But now I've added on resistance and weight training because lifestyle medicine says that should be done about two times a week um, mm -hmm. to prevent osteoporosis. Right. Um, so yeah, they want us to do all three aspects. They want us to do flexibility and balance, yeah. um, which I get with my yoga. They want us to do cardiovascular and, and endurance, which yeah. you which I get from a bit of swimming or running or biking. Um, and then strength and resistance training, which I have never done until now. Are you enjoying that? I am. I'm actually going to some um, HIIT classes, high intensity oh, training. And it's been, it's been fun. That's great. I love to tell people, you know, that to get stronger, you don't necessarily have to start lifting barbells. You know, there are lots of body weight exercises that really can improve your strength. Absolutely. And, yeah. Even including like holding a plank or yes. um, trying to get into or doing push ups or mm -hmm. getting into, I try to start doing handstand with the help of a um, ball. I can't do it without a ball yet, but. But even things like that, you know, those yeah. count. Absolutely. So great. Well, Dr. Chow, I wonder if there's anything else that you feel that you uh, should tell us, any takeaway messages for any women who are listening, who may be just getting started, um, need just a little guidance or a little nugget to take with them um, to, to sort of push them to the next step. What would you, what would your takeaway message be? So my message would be one, take, become the CEO of your health, get empowered, um, and get support. It's really hard to do it on your own. Um, join online summits like this, join Facebook groups, or join your uh, local potluck in your city. Be around other people who are on this path. 
um, we know from Blue Zones research and we know from a lot of other research that when we're around people who are also trying to get healthy, that improves our health. Um, so, you know, the tips that I, I wrote down as my gift for lifestyle dogs, the tips to thrive are eat right, really as much whole food plant-based as you can, be fit, um, try to do at least 150 minutes a week of exercise. That's just for maintenance of health. If we're trying to lose weight or reverse diseases, it needs to go up to 300 to 420 minutes a week, but 150 minutes is minimal. Great. Um, and then stress less, find some kind of mindfulness activities in your life. And you know, yoga counts, meditation counts, playing a musical instrument counts, gardening counts, anything that keeps you present in the present moment really reduces those stress hormones, not just during the time that you're doing the mindfulness activity, but for several hours later as well. Um, and then the fourth thing is connect more. Um, really find that village, find other women who are, are, are on this path and, and do it together. It makes it easier and more fun. Absolutely. Those are great words of wisdom. Thank you so much. And before we say goodbye, I know you do have this special gift for our audience. Could you just share a little bit of, of what it is that, that includes all of these beautiful pieces that you just shared? Yeah, so it basically is a little um, handout that we made. And if, if you click on it, it'll take you to our website and you can download it for free. Um, it basically goes into these four things that I said eat right, be fit, stress less, connect more, and how you can do that. It's just to inspire you to go further down this path of lifestyle medicine. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chala. It's such a pleasure to speak with you today. Thanks for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Margot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.